Hasta luego Madrid. I am in a taxi on the way to the airport now just at about noon and I have a couple hours until my flight takes off to Barcelona. It's been an, a really interesting and inspiring two weeks here in Madrid. I've just loved being in Europe. I've loved the cafes and being able to walk places and beautiful parks and beautiful streets and beautiful architecture. It's really been such a pleasure. So the reason that I'm flying today to Barcelona instead of taking the train, which I think would be the normal thing to do, is just that I have so much luggage and it's not possible for me to wheel three suitcases through a train station and onto a train platform by myself. So I had no choice but to fly there. And a plane ticket actually is not that much more expensive than the train. For some reason, the train is strangely expensive. You would think it wouldn't be, but that's not the case. Um, at least if you go in first class. So, uh, yeah, it's just a um, couple hours until I'll be in Barcelona. The flight is really short. And I'll see you there. So I think I mentioned that I am actually flying business class on this short flight between Madrid and Barcelona and the reason that I did that is just because I have so much luggage again that with the extra luggage fees and everything it came out to not that expensive and not much more expensive again than if I had taken a train in first class. So this flight only cost me $180 and it got me fast track access through security which was really luxurious. I didn't have to wait at all. I could take my time unpacking my stuff and then repacking it and then um, now I'm in the, they call it Sala VIP, which is just the lounge. And it's nicely designed. There's nothing like super special here, but I think I might be in the domestic terminal. I'm not sure, I'm in terminal four. But there is a hot buffet and some drinks and this and that. And I'm also seeing that I think if you have an Amex Platinum, then you can also enter into this lounge. But yeah, of course that makes sense. With Amex Platinum, you can enter into like a ton of lounges. So anyway, I have an hour until my flight to Barcelona and I'm just chilling and waiting and excited, very, very excited to be in Barcelona. So this is business class on a domestic flight in Spain on Iberia. It's actually funny because it's only one row. So I'm in the front and behind me is just the curtain. The only thing I mean that's worth it, actually as I said it's not that much more expensive, is you have fast track access through security, you have lounge access, and then at least then the middle seat is unoccupied. So you don't really have to worry about having enough space for your overhead cabin baggage and everything like that. So to me, definitely worth it for $180 to go from Madrid to Barcelona, you know, without a headache, without stress, without having to lug three gigantic suitcases through a train station, absolutely worth it. <laughs> I think the devil himself designed the airport in Barcelona. I've been walking already, it feels like 10 minutes from the gate to try to get to the baggage claim. And it's just like this insane circle. And even in Madrid, I actually have to say the airport was also terribly designed, like very, very vague directions. And just trying to find el equipaje, el, I don't know, it's, it's like, it's just too much, too much walking. All right, 
it. Well, I made it to Barcelona, Barcelona in a taxi. Uh, Uber just seemed far too complicated and it seemed like they were just going to order a local taxi anyway. So it's about a 30 minute drive into the city to the hotel where I'm staying. And yes, I am totally incognito between the hat and the mask and everything else. But the surprising thing is, even though I'm dressed the way I am, quite elegantly, nobody is really staring at me. I think, I think that this is just, uh, I guess, common to see people dress very elegantly in Spain. But uh, I only have today pretty much, and Sunday I'm afraid that everything is pretty much closed. So I need to make the most of my short time here. Because it's my last two nights in Spain, I really wanted to do it up fancy here in Barcelona. And so I booked two nights at the Hotel Casa Fuster. This is a historical or like monument hotel, five stars, totally luxurious. I'm going to show you my room, which is called a superior room. I guess it's like one level above the deluxe just because it had a little bit more closet space and stuff. It's so freaking gorgeous decorated. It's beautifully decorated. Um, you don't want to see my face, trust me, you want to see this room. So let's start from the very beginning. And welcome inside. So first we have this little salon area, which is just a nice kind of, I guess, breathing area, and then led into the bedroom. Look at how fabulous this bed is, how gorgeous. The only thing is I don't know why they kind of have two single beds squished together. Like, it's a little bit weird to me, but I love, love, love the blue velvet chairs. And then over the side, there's the TV. There's a desk with the coffee maker, the Nespresso machine, which I really hate Nespresso machines, I've come to find. Uh, mini bar, I think, but very chic. Look at this dark wood. Can you see it? No, probably not. It's like uh, some very beautiful dark wood. And then, anyway, the closet space over here, which actually also can be closed. So. Plenty, plenty, plenty of room for my suitcases. If I was actually staying here for a long time, I would hang up all my stuff. But unfortunately, just two nights. Uh, let's go into the gorgeous bathroom, shall we? That's always one of my favorite places in a hotel. So sink, and then on the right side, bathtub. Oh my God, with jacuzzi jets. You know what I'm gonna be doing tonight. And then on the left side, we have the shower. We have a bidet and obviously a toilet. So quite a fabulous bathroom as well. And that's the whole room. Because I have so little time in Barcelona, like my flight is actually leaving at 10 a.m. on Monday. It's now 4 p.m. on Saturday. Tomorrow morning I have to do a COVID PCR test as a requirement to go back to Bali, which is again like super stressful and really expensive. I have to pay I think 130 euros to get the two hour service again because it's a Sunday and I need the results in time for my flight the next morning. Today is literally the only day that I have that I can go shopping. Um, and the only thing that I want to buy here in Barcelona is a pair of nudie jeans because the denim in Indonesia really sucks. There's no good jean stores and the importation tax on garments is absurdly high. So I'm going to this store. I think it's like a 15 minute walk away and I'm in a very luxurious area as well. On the way here, we passed like Prada and Gucci and all of that stuff. Um, so I'm going to have a little walk tomorrow. Again, everything will probably be, cl be closed because it's Sunday and I've got to do my COVID stuff early in the morning, but then we'll see what the rest of the day has in store. This video will be a vlog style format because it's such a short trip and kind of so like I don't even know what the hell I'm doing, that I'll just take you along with me and we'll have fun and we'll see what we see in Barcelona. I obviously won't be able to give any advice really because I'm here for such a short time and it is my first time, but I'm excited to discover this city with you. Let's go together, vamonos.
So I've really come all of this way just to get a pair of jeans, honestly. Uh, I think the nudie jeans are the best. I don't want to advertise for them, but they do free repairs for life. So it's really about sustainability. I just think that if I get this one, then I'll bring them to Ibu Ayu in Bali and have her shorten, have her hem the bottoms. So I thought that I was going to have to bring my jeans to Ibu Ayu in Bali, but also I found out they do free, um, how to say, free adjustments right here and right now. So I can get these perfectly sized. So I've come to this restaurant, I actually have no idea what the name is, but it was recommended to me by the nudie jeans shop salesman, and it's also just right next door. That's probably why he recommended it, but it's nice to be on terrasse, to be sitting outside here, because the weather is actually quite lovely today in Barcelona. It's just under 60 degrees Fahrenheit, but the sun is shining, and it is lovely. This restaurant is a bit expensive, um, like, <laughs> and <laughs> they keep trying to upsell me on other things, but I just want something very simple, because it's a very weird hour to eating right now at uh, quarter to six. So far, everything in Barcelona, very lovely, but what can I say, I've been here for an hour. I just went shopping and now I'm having food, so what could be bad about that? As I had said in my previous video about Madrid, Madrid, what am I saying? I don't even know what accent I'm using anymore, but one of the things I really like about Spain is Rioja wine, which is very tasty and very cheap. Actually, I have no idea what this glass costs, but usually it's like three or four euros in a restaurant. I think this one probably costs more because it's kind of a chic spot in like the heart of a very chic area. But nonetheless, great, great wine in Spain. So I've just come back to the hotel after a lovely walk in a shop and having some tapas on the sidewalk, just watching. I don't know how this light is, how I like this, but anyway. Yeah, so I'm just having a breath because I have a date tonight at 8 p.m. And I went down to the concierge to ask for a recommendation. And then she made me a reservation at a place that is close by. And that is supposed to be good and healthy and not too intimidating. Because I have to say, between you and me, I end up paying every single time I go out here with a guy in Spain. Because they always have less money than me. And I do find it's like the same situation <laughs> Is when I'm in Bali, I've become at my young age like a sugar daddy, but that's beside the point. Um, I'm just happy to actually like have a date and be doing something tonight because it's Saturday night and I hate on the weekends here in Spain, like when I was in Madrid or whatever, to have nothing to do on the weekends. Like if people were busy and I wasn't invited and whatever the case is and I had nothing to do, like it's just a bad feeling because it feels like all of Spain is out eating and drinking and having fun and then you're like sitting all by yourself kind of sad so I'm happy that I have a date tonight even if I have to pay no pasa nada as they say in Spanish not a big deal and oh my god I'm just so happy I love being in a hotel room that makes me feel good like I know that it's a splurge and it's a luxury but for me these are the kind of moments that I just treasure the most like in travel being I don't know, treated like really special it just makes me very happy. You can see the smile on my face is, is real. So this hotel has a little gym, but it's sufficient after not working out for a week because of the ridiculousness of the situation in Madrid. But um, moreover, I mean, the view from the gym is spectacular. Check this out. I don't think that there's any place better, any view better to do your cardio than right here. After a quick workout, it was time to get ready for my date. We met at a little restaurant nearby the hotel. I won't kiss and tell, but it was a nice evening. Travel is all fun and games until somebody has to wake up at 8 a.m. on a Sunday to go to a COVID lab and get a PCR test so that you can fly back to Bali. Ugh. The way that these things have happened is that because I got in rather late on Saturday, the clinics were, at least the ones that I looked at, were already closed. And now I have to go this morning because to enter Bali, you need a negative 
PCR test 48 hours before departure. So today being Sunday is the only day I can do it. And because my flight is at 10 a.m. tomorrow, I have to pay for the two hour expedited service. So this COVID negative PCR test, I mean, hopefully it's negative, is costing me 130 euros. That's insane. I guess travel nowadays is only for wealthy people. Um, because that's just such a stupid extra expense. But that's still the requirement for Indonesia. So I am going to take you with me to this COVID test place. It's about a 15 minute walk, but first, very, very first, coffee. All right, I just finished my COVID test. 130 euros later, felt kind of like a, I don't know what word to say, but they swabbed really deep into the, the mouth and in the nose, really nasty feeling, but obviously fingers crossed now that it's negative because I can't even imagine what would happen if I had a positive result and the horror of trying to fix that problem would be, but no bad energy. I should have the results by email in two hours. Again, that's why I paid extra because my flight leaves Monday morning. Today is Sunday. Everything is closed in Spain. I can't wait even 24 hours. So, voila. That's the situation. Now I'm walking back to my hotel. Shit, I'm walking on a red light uh, to get some breakfast. Actually, I'm going to stop on the way to just get a croissant because I'm sure the breakfast at the hotel is ridiculously expensive. Um, and, yeah, so today is my only day in Barcelona, but I did the thing that I had to do, which was the PCR test. So today... Even though it's actually freezing, I have the unfortunate uh, distinction of coming here like on the coldest day and then once I leave it starts to get warmer progressively every day. But I have to take advantage of the fact that it's my only day. So I'm going to go try, walk, see the sights, do all that and uh, meet you somewhere, somewhere interesting and beautiful. So on my way back to the hotel, I've just stopped into this um, cute restaurant cafe called, I don't know how to pronounce this, but it looks like sweet in French and bowls. Um, however, the menu that they've given me is in Catalan, and I don't speak Catalan, I just speak Spanish, French, English, Indonesian, and Italian, but Catalan is not one of the languages that I speak. <laughs> so I am struggling a bit to understand what is on offer. Back in my hotel, actually just having a little cafecito in the lobby bar because my room is currently being cleaned right now by room service. However, in this very moment, I just received the email that my results are ready from the COVID lab and we're gonna check it together. I'm actually kind of afraid. I mean, I'm pretty sure I don't have COVID, but let's just find out and be sure if I'm actually gonna be able to fly tomorrow. Resultados pruebas. Negativo. Prueba. Yay, I don't have COVID. So my friends, I am indeed negative for COVID. Therefore, I can fly tomorrow to Bali. It only cost me, as I said, 130 euros. But I got the test results within about, actually less than two hours, probably about an hour and 15 minutes. So thank God. Um, a friend recommended me to this clinic that was just a 15 minute walk from the hotel and that they were actually open on a Sunday because walking around Barcelona this morning me di cuenta, I realized that like everything is closed. Everything is closed on Sundays. So to find a clinic that's open and that could get me results that quickly, huge relief and um, just a deep sigh of relief. I think that I have everything that I need to go back to Bali. Basically, I needed that COVID test and I'm already a resident of Bali. So that takes care of like all of the visa stuff and what else do I need to go back to Bali? I guess that's pretty much it. Um, so 
Once I can get back to my room and change my boots, which are, again, causing me problems. If you watch my turkey video, you know that these are not made for walking shoes, but I love them so much. Um, I want to put on comfortable shoes and take a walk around the city, see the sights, all of that. It is cold, as I said earlier, but I'm going to a front. Sometimes I'm sorry, guys. I like I think in different languages because I speak four or five, and like sometimes I think of a word like affronté. I'm pretty sure it's French, um, and I don't know if it exists in English. But this happens to me, even though English is my first language. When you speak a bunch of different languages, and especially being in Spain for the last couple of weeks and speaking Spanish, my head starts to get like all jumbled with different words and different languages. Um, but anyway, I think that you guys can understand me. I am going to go out and face, I think that's the right expression, face the cold weather and see the beauty of Barcelona with all the stores closed, which is good for me because I'm a shopaholic and I have a very hard time restraining myself from buying stuff that I really don't need. So pardon the fact that I'm filming this on my front facing iPhone camera because I'm just not in the mood to take out my regular camera right now because it's very slightly misting and raining. But I'm on the way to uh, the Design Museum, which just so happens to be free on the first Sunday of the month, which it is today, and I am very lucky. So that's where I'm headed. But on my way there, I am passing the very famous Sagrada Familia, I think it's called. I should actually know this much better, but anyway. Look what I'm looking at right now. So it's been about a 25, 30 minute walk and right in front of me now is the design museum and I am looking forward to at least visiting one museum in my time in Barcelona. I visited two expositions, two exhibits in Madrid and they were really interesting and in this design museum I think there's all types of things like um, textile, fashion, furniture, all of the kinds of things that actually interest me. So as I said, if you come on the very first Sunday of the month, entrance is free you just have to reserve your ticket online before, uh, which I did super easy. And now we're just walking up and hopefully I'll be able to film a little bit inside. The second floor, in my opinion, has a lot more interesting things to look at because this is the decorative arts permanent exhibition. So there's everything from textiles to ceramics to um, furniture and lots of lots of things just to look at. Actually, this one is really cool. Look at this. Again, looking at all of this interesting furniture. Look at this. I guess it's like a tape bed behind me, but also kind of like a kingly chariot. Very chic and fabulous. All of these vintage uh, time pieces and just beautiful artifacts, you know, from a different time when things were made with craftsmanship, when things were made by hand. And that is personally something that I am very passionate about is handmade. I love to see the beauty of handmade artisanal things and so in this particular exhibition on the second floor there is all of that. It's really magnificent to look at and inspiring. I apologize for how dark it is in here but I've reached the fourth or third floor, the one that is actually the most interesting to me which is the fashion exhibition and apparently for reasons of conservation it's kept very very dark in here. But I've just walked in and I'm seeing these uh, like bustiers and corsets and things like this. Very interesting, very historical to see how these things were actually made, you know, in the epoque that they were made. So very fascinating for people who, like me, if you love fashion design, to come and to experience and see the history behind some of these things. 
So this particular window behind me shows the evolution of the women's corset from above down to the bra. So from the 1700s to the 1900s, how um, these things have evolved over the centuries. Here we've reached the section of what I would imagine like the dressing room of the Dowager Countess from Downton Abbey. Uh, totally her decade, her uh, era basically of clothing. This is up until 1910, which is when I think that Downton, Ab Downton Abbey actually starts like 1912 with the sinking of the Titanic. So the fashion of this period would have been very much her style and so I'm sure the costume designer was inspired by archives like this. So what I'm looking at now is the evolution of women's fashion from 1910 to 1930 and basically how when women stopped wearing corsets the silhouette has changed. I think we have Coco Chanel to thank for that or you know is responsible for that and so you see these 20s sort of flapper style uh, dresses evolving with kind of an A-line shape and to me it's less flattering. I would prefer a woman in a corset, but probably for women this was much more comfortable. And here we have the evolution of haute couture between the years 1930 and 1960. This is maybe like my favorite uh, epoch of fashion, looking at these dresses, especially this really elegant black chic simple one that looks like it's made in velvet if I can see from behind the window but just gorgeous silhouettes very very chic I think that um are some of these Balenciaga let's see Balenciaga being the most famous fashion designer from Spain the most famous haute couturier from Spain okay I'm very proud of myself as a fashion historian because yes indeed most of these dresses are by Cristobal Balenciaga as I said the most famous Spanish haute couture designer, but basically this new look that they're talking about from the 1930s to the 1960s was ushered in in large part by Yves Saint Laurent. And let's see, Balenciaga. Yes, these are all, all of these gorgeous dresses are from the Balenciaga haute couture collection. Just absolutely stunning when you look at them up close and you see the details on the embroidery and just the silhouette is Wow. Now we're looking at the evolution of fashion between the 1960s and the 1990s with the introduction of prêt à porter, which means ready to wear, and how that changed dramatically the women's silhouette and also just the youth culture of the 60s becoming more things like kind of unisex, pants for women, all of that kind of stuff. So it's sort of ushering in the modern era of fashion design. So lastly, we enter into the modern age where it's anything goes basically in fashion and uh, with the men's and the women's clothes there are some what I would call hits and some definite misses. For me this fashion exhibition was by far the most interesting part of the entire museum and I started in the wrong place but it doesn't matter because I want to read you actually what the point of this exposition was. Since ancient times human beings have altered the shape and appearance of their bodies by means of hairstyle jewelry, tattoos, and especially their clothes. In every age, the different ways of dressing are intimately connected with moral, social, and aesthetic codes. Fashion imposes standards of beauty, silhouettes, and volumes are modified, and nature gives way to artifice. Clothes change the body's proportions and alter the wearer's relationship with physical space and other people. The exhibition Dressing the Body sets out to show how clothes modify the appearance of the body by ways of actions that have alternately 
tended to compress it and liberate it from the 16th century to the present. So very fascinating to see the evolution of fashion and how it relates to society over basically 500 years. So very interesting. Um, I'm glad I came here. I'm glad it was free because I wouldn't have wanted to pay necessarily for um, most of this museum, but the top floor of fashion, definitely worth it if you love fashion. So I ended up walking on the way back to the hotel from the museum and it's kind of very lightly misting, raining, just like it was in Madrid. Like it's not a heavy rain, it's not a big deal to walk in, though it is quite cold, it's eight degrees Celsius. And I stopped along the way at this place, um, like a poke restaurant, but I noticed something really interesting on the menu that I've never seen before, which is a poke pizza. And that's what I've ordered now. It's about lunchtime, I think it's like two, 2.30 or something. So I still kind of have the whole rest of the day, but I think I need a little bit of a siesta just because I've walked now, I think three miles total, like to the museum and back in not great weather. Um, but I'm really close by my hotel and I'm looking forward to seeing what this poke pizza is actually like. I guess a poke pizza is basically just a poke bowl but that's put in a pizza form because there's no way obviously you can eat that like a pizza. The only thing that's holding it together at the bottom is a nori, like seaweed sushi piece, whatever you call that. So you still have to eat it with a fork and knife, but whatever. It's an interesting concept, even if not 100% successful. So guys, the only way for me to finish this video without it being totally random is to explain what happened with the rest of my time in Barcelona. Basically, long story short, I met a really, really beautiful guy in the afternoon around 4.30 and we ended up spending the entire rest of the day and the entire night together. So I didn't film really anything else from my time in Barcelona because I just had this really great connection with this person and I think that's why ultimately I got so emotional when I left the next morning and you're about to see that reaction. So I'm a little bit more together and I'm recording this video now because I basically just burst out crying when I passed through the immigration. I realized that I really don't want to leave Spain and I, I'm not ready to go back to Bali. I just have found myself so much more alive here and contented and the fact that I'm able to meet so many more people and date and I met a guy last night that I ended up spending the whole day and the whole night with and it was really hard to say goodbye this morning like when you feel that spark with someone or you just feel like the time is off and I, I just feel like I didn't have enough time away from Bali like it's only been a month that I've been gone and it's gone by so quickly and I'm just not ready to go back to my life into my routine there I really feel more alive and, and more content in Europe even though life here is obviously far more expensive and has its own difficulties and I just don't I can't live all year round in Bali and I really want to plan another trip to Europe as soon as possible I think that my plan is to rent out my villa if possible i need to negotiate with my landlord but basically then come back to europe for a couple months at a time i just i'm much happier you know in a place where there are other people like me or i don't know just the open the openness of spain has really touched me the people that i've met here the experiences that I've had, the cultural experiences, and just being in a place that feels intellectual, you know, like that I'm using my, that I'm using my brain, which I don't use in Bali, to be honest, and I feel, I know that it is counterintuitive to a lot of people, but Bali does not bring out the best in me anymore, I think, because I've been there so long, and I kind of take it for granted in some ways, like what it offers me, and when I tell people about my life in Bali, you know, they say, oh my God, like you have the dream life. But to me, it doesn't feel like that anymore. To me, the dream life would be, <laughs> would be to spend time in Europe, you know, and to just, is where I feel like I fit in, you know, I don't fit in in Bali. I have one friend there. 
over three years, you know, and I don't go out and I don't socialize because they're just not my people. And I've really felt, I've really felt at home and I've felt happy in Spain and it's been a long time since I've felt that way. It's so ridiculous that I'm crying. I don't know if it's like I'm exhausted emotionally from barely sleeping last night and the stress of just travel and everything is is a lot but I'm not gonna keep crying on camera and I actually have to get to my gate soon it's like a 15 minute walk away but today I'm flying again Singapore Airlines in business class all the way back to Bali so from Barcelona to Singapore with I think a brief stopover in Milan but not changing planes and then from Singapore to Bali with not a long layover either, but it's still like a 20 plus hour travel day. I just want to sleep, I think. The whole time, and I'm sure I'll feel okay when I get back to Bali, but I just don't want to stay there a long time. Uh.